Hello, travelers, and welcome to Adventures in Myth and History. And I am your guide, Tom Olzak. The people we call the Pilgrims were part of a group of pious people who believed that the correct way to worship their God was to strip away everything but what was taught in the Bible, including rites, rituals, and the teachings of churches. Because of their efforts to purify the Church of England, they were labeled Puritans, a label that describes most of the early settlers of New England. The Pilgrims were a sect of Puritans who separated from the Church of England. The rulers of England did not tolerate beliefs other than the Church of England. Any people meeting separately were usually considered traitors to the king, traitors that were often imprisoned or even executed. These conditions insult, resulted in the Puritans, especially the Separatists, looking for another way to safely worship in the ways they believed correct. This video looks at the rise of the Puri Puritan Separatists, who became the Pilgrims, their escape to Holland, why they left for America, and their arrival in the New World. The bi bibliography for this video is in the video description, as is the video script a script formatted like a study guide. Although there are several primary sources listed, I relied most upon William Bradford's On Plymouth Plantation. If you learned something, please remember to subscribe and click on the bell to be notified of new channel content. If you want to support my channel, consider donating to the cause. Again, the Puritans were one of the sects resulting from the 16th century religious reformation. The Reformation, a break from the Roman Catholic Church, began with Martin Luther in the early 1500s. This was followed by their other movements, but the movement of most interest in this story is the rise of Calvinism, a movement started by the French theologian John Calvin and other reformers of the time, like the Swiss theologian Holgic Zwingli. It was named Calvinism by Lutherans, who opposed its beliefs. Calvinist doctrine focuses on five easily remembered principles, easily remembered using the memory jogger TULIP. The first is total depravity. All men are by nature depraved and cannot be saved by their own efforts. This conflicts with Catholicism, which teaches that man can improve himself through learning good works, prayer, and following the rules of the church, and through these efforts he can gain salvation. Unconditional Election God saves whoever he chooses. This is the primary element of predestination, the belief that God already knows who saved and grants saving grace only to those men and women. No one else has any chance for salvation. Limited Atonement Jesus' death only ensured atonement for those already selected by God. Irresistible Grace When God grants His grace to someone, that person cannot resist. The person shall be saved and will act accordingly. And finally, Perseverance of the Saints Salvation is secured if you're selected. This explanation is very brief, and there's much more to these teachings. However, Digging deeply into theology is not the purpose of this story. Calvinist-leaning Anglicans, the future Puritans, also believed that each congregation of believers had its own covenant with God, a covenant that superseded any attempts at outside control, control imposed by bishops, popes, and kings. This is known as Congregationalism. They also focused on the belief that the Bible was the only authoritative word of God. Any other rites or teachings were just the invention of men. These beliefs and tenets were incompatible with the Church of England, an incompatibility that significantly irritated the Anglicans and began a rift between mainstream Anglicans and the emerging Puritan movement. When Henry VIII split from the Roman Catholic Church, he wanted to retain as much of the Catholic rites, rituals, and teachings as possible. He just wanted to rid himself of the Pope. Well, this was fine with most Anglicans. Those who adopted Calvin's teachings believed that the Church of England retained practices that deviated from the true practice of Christianity and adhered too closely to popery. 
most Puritans didn't want to separate from the Church of England, attempting to move it further from the trappings of Catholicism. However, more radical Puritans decided to separate from the Anglican faith, holding Sabbath meetings in homes or other locations outside Anglican churches. Because the Church of England was the official church and led by the crown, it became treasonous when James I assumed the throne in 1603 to worship outside of his auspices, resulting in arrests and occasional execution. For this reason, separatists began leaving England. One group of separatists, under the religious guidance of Pastor John Robinson, moved from Yorkshire, England, and settled in Leiden, Holland, in 1607. After about 12 years, circumstances caused them to consider moving to another location. First, in England, the Leiden Puritans had, become far had been farmers. However, in Leiden, they had to find work across multiple industries, work that required long hours over six days a week. This is not how they wanted to live. They wanted more time for God, family, and congregation. Second, a treaty between Holland and Spain was about to expire. While Holland was a Protestant country, Spain was strongly Roman Catholic. If Spain moved back into Holland, Puritans would again be exposed to persecution. Finally, the children of the Separatists, or the Puritans, were growing out of being both English and Puritan because of peer pressure and the overall influences of Dutch culture. In 1619, the congregation decided that it was their spiritual and patriotic duty to plant a godly English plantation in the New World. They considered themselves God-fearing Englishmen and wanted to settle in a place where they could worship in their own way and protect their children from unwanted influences, while still remaining English. They were committed to a religious pilgrimage to a more promising land which is why one member of the group, William Bradford, who would later become governor of Plymouth, called them Pilgrims, a name not used by others until 1820, when Daniel Webster referred to them as Pilgrims. Deciding to leave, although a difficult decision, was easier than actually obtaining what was needed to make the trip. First, the Pilgrims needed a patent to be granted land to start a plantation, a settlement. A patent was a franchise issued by the Crown that gave settlers the right to found a community in North America. If the colony survived for five to seven years, during which time the Crown would receive import duties and taxes, the settlers would be given title to the land. Most patents were given to companies, the earliest of which were partnerships or joint stock entities. The agent for the Pilgrims in England was able to obtain a patent from the Virginia Company in 1619. However, they did not have the money to finance the trip, a challenge that caused William Bradford to sell his light and home. Still, having insufficient funds, they eventually fell to the smooth-talking salesmanship of Thomas Weston, representative of Merchant Adventurers, a group of about 70 London investors investors looking for a return on their investment, and a way to plant religion in the New World. The adventurers had their own patent for a settlement at the mouth of the Hudson River. The pilgrims would throw in with them and share the patent, sharing based on the adventurers and pilgrims joining into a joint stock company. The company would be financed mainly by the adventurers, with repayment by the pilgrims through New World cod fishing and fur trading. Each pilgrim was to, receive, was to receive a single share of the company and work four days per week for the company during the seven-year patent period. All shareholders would share the company's capital and profits when the patent period was over. As the pilgrims planned to leave Europe in the spring of 1620, they took a census to see who was willing to travel in the first group. This group would serve as an advance party that would get the plantation ready for the rest. 125 of Leiden separatists, about a third of the total, were willing to make the trip. Pastor Robinson would remain behind, taking care of the needs of the Leiden separatists, with Ellis Brewster taking over religious duties for the departing group. 
As it turns out, Weston was not the blessing the pilgrims thought he was. Claiming that the conditions of the trip had changed, he said it was necessary to change the original agreement, requiring the pilgrims to spend every day instead of four working for the company. This was needed, according to Weston, because they would likely make less than they had initially thought from fishing and trading. The pilgrims refused to go along with the new plan, even though their representative in London, Robert Cushman, had agreed to the new deal without consulting them. Further, concerns arose when in June, pilgrims learned that Weston still had not engaged ships for the journey. Consequently, they started to take their own steps to ensure they arrived in the colonies before winter. The pilgrims purchased a ship in Holland. It was a small ship they, could, they would use for fishing once they arrived in the New World. The vessel, named the Speedwell, would also be a safety net, a way to return to Europe if things went poorly on their new plantation. They hired a master, Mr. Reynolds, and a crew. They also refitted the ship with masts that would become a disabling challenge later. Over the following weeks, the pilgrims were hampered by the failure of Christopher Martin, the adventurer's purchasing agent, to collaborate in the purchasing of supplies. So the pilgrims gathered supplies of their own at their own expense. In July, the pilgrims traveled to Delshaven, where the Speedwell awaited their boarding. They soon departed from for Southampton, England. At Southampton, they would join up with the Adventurers Party, a party made up of non-separatists and other separatists, including William Brewster, who were joining them for the trip. It was also where the Mayflower waited, the ship finally engaged by the Adventurers for the journey. The Mayflower was much bigger than the Speedwell. It was rated at 180 tons, about three times the size of the Pilgrim ship, and was mastered by Christopher Jones. During their preparations at Southampton, the fracture between the Pilgrims and the Adventurers widened. Weston told them that if they refused to work full-time for the investors, no more money would be provided, resulting in a severe financial challenge for the Pilgrims. To pay off what they owed and to finish getting ready, the Pilgrims had to sell off some of their foodstuffs, including two tons of butter. As they finally departed Southampton, en route to the New World, they found the Speedwell less seaworthy than expected, causing them to put in at Dartmouth for repairs, repairs needed to stop severe linking. They only made it about 75 miles from Southampton. Everyone moved temporarily to the Mayflower. By August 17th, the Speedwell was considered ready, but the weather and wind prevented sailing. Stuck in Dartmouth, going through their much-needed supplies, Many pilgrims decided they no longer wanted to sail to the New World. However, Martin, the governor of the voyage, refused to let anyone off the Mayflower. No one was allowed on shore for any reason. They finally departed from Dartmouth, but they only made it about 200 miles before the Speedwell leaked too much to continue, causing them to put back in at Plymouth. At this point, it was decided not to continue with the Speedwell. This meant that the Pilgrims would be stranded in the New World with no way back if things went poorly. This is because the Mayflower was not purchased by the adventurers, it was only leased. This was a significant loss. It appears that the Speedwell's master, Reynolds, was working against the Pilgrims. He knew that the larger mast would result in overmasting a condition that results in too much torque on the hull, a twist that opens gaps between the hull's planking. Bradford concluded that Reynolds did it because he was afraid of making the voyage. Everyone from the Speedwell would not fit on the Mayflower, so decisions had to be made about who would stay behind. The final complement on the Mayflower when they departed was 102 passengers, including 50 pilgrims and 52 others not counting the crew. They departed Plymouth, England on September 6, 1620. At this point, they were low on supplies and the passengers were weak from spending weeks on the ships. No one at the time of the journey, at least no one sailing on the Mayflower, knew of the Gulf Stream 
an Atlantic current that moved east as the Mayflower tried to sail west. This resulted in a traveling speed of about two miles per hour, making the trip last 65 days. They finally saw Cape Cod on Thursday, November 9, 1620. During the trip, Jones knew that they were further north than their planned route, a route that was to take them to the mouth of the Hudson River. However, he also knew that their supplies and the passengers' deteriorating health required reaching shore as soon as possible. So, instead of changing course, he decided to take the shortest route possible to North America, straight ahead. Jones and the settlers decided to try for their patent land about 220 miles south of where they had reached land. But Jones did not know the coastline, and he had no charts for that area. Consequently, he ended up in one of the worst places on the coast, the Pollock Rip. The rip was an area consisting of sandy shoals and riptides that tossed ships around like corks. They fought the tides and eventually broke free. Because Jones was not willing to chance any further encounters with the unknown, and for that fact neither were the passengers, he decided to head back to Cape Cod. According to Bradford, but when they had sailed that course about half ye day, they fell upon dangerous shoals and roaring breakers, and that they were so far entangled there with as they conceived themselves in super danger. And ye wind shrinking upon them withal, they resolved to endure up again for the Cape, and concept them themselves happy to get out of those dangers earlier that night than night time overtook them as by way of God's windfall they did. And ye subsequent day they got into ye Cape Harbor, where they rid in safety. As they sailed the coast back to Cape Cod, some non-separatists talked about not sticking with the pilgrims, of going it alone. Based on the lateness of the year, the lack of supplies, and the overall low number of colonists, the majority thought this a bad idea but they had no patent that stipulated how the plantation would be governed or how the settlers would cooperate. So, on their way back to the Cape from the Rip, they drew up and signed the Mayflower Compact, an agreement everyone had to sign before setting foot on North American soil. The compact, signed by 41 men on November 11, 1620, is recorded by Bradford as follows. In ye call of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal topics of our dread sovereign Lord, King James, via ye grace of God, of Great Britain, France, and Ireland King, defender of ye religion, etc., having undertaken for the ye glory of God and advancements of ye Christian faith and honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant ye first colony in ye northern components of Virginia, do by those provide solemnly and mutually in ye presence of God, and considered one of every other, covenant and integrate ourselves together, right into a civil frame politic, for our higher ordering and protection and furtherance of ye ends aforesaid, and by way of virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and body such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and workplaces from time to time as shall be concept most meet and handy for ye general exact of ye colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. And witness whereof we have hereunder subscribed our names at Cape Cod, ye eleven, of November, and ye year of ye reign of our sovereign lord, King James of England, France, and Ireland, ye eighteenth, and of Scotland, ye fiftieth, fourth, Anno Domini, 1620. In addition to the compact, the plantation needed a governor. Before the signing, the pilgrims had decided they would never accept Martin, who was the onboard governor, as the settlement governor. They settled on one of their number, John Carver. He was formally elected governor after the compact signing. Upon arriving back at the Cape, 
Jones decided to anchor in what is today known as Provincetown Harbor near Long Point. From here, the passengers would explore the surrounding area to find a good place to establish a plantation, a plantation not approved by the patent issued in England. The land at the point did not look like a good place to settle, but it was land. It was also Sunday, a day not meant for exploration and work. Instead of a general debarkation, 16 armed men, led by Captain Miles Standish, the plantation's military leader, went to shore for a short exploration mission, an exploration that lasted a day of walking through trees and sand and seeing no other people. About this first landing, Bradford wrote, Being thus arrived in a very good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed ye God of heaven, who had delivered them over ye great and furious ocean, and brought them from all ye perils and miseries thereof, again to set their feet on the ye firm and solid earth, their proper element. Standage's team cut some fragrant cedar and took it back to the ship, a place overwhelmed with the smells of over 100 people having been at sea for over two months. On Monday, the settlers were taken ashore, where they washed clothes and enjoyed being on land again. Further, the shallop, a large boat needed to transport large numbers of the settlers and supplies, was taken ashore for reassembly and repair. While the shallop was being made seaworthy, Standish led a mi an exploration mission along the path shown from November 15th to the 17th. They saw a small group of Native Americans and chased them to make contact. Instead of finding the Native Americans, however, they found baskets of corn buried at what is marked as Corn Hill. The pilgrims decided to take the corn, given their shortage of supplies. Because there was too much corn to carry, they took what they could and reburied the rest, planning to return to retrieve the rest when they could. They knew this was a risk, but they intended to pay the Native Americans for the corn once they made contact, which, as we'll see in a later video, they actually did. The shallop was ready by November 27th, resulting in 24 settlers and 10 sailors embarking on another exploration mission. But this time, Dandish was second in command to Jones, the Mayflower's master. Jones did this to help the pilgrims more quickly find a permanent place to take their cargo so he could return to England. They made it to a place they called Cold Harbor and walked for hours. The Oval is a very rough approximation of the area covered. They decided this was not a reasonable settlement area. Although they didn't see any Native Americans, they did find what appeared to be an abandoned village. They also returned to Corn Hill, where they reco recovered the corn left behind during the first exploration, and an additional 10 bushels. At this point, the Native Americans were aware of the corn theft, and the settlers knew the hill was an active storage cache. With at least half of the crew ill, suffering from the icy cold weather, they returned to the Mayflower. After a few days of recovery and planning, a group once again embarked on an exploratory mission intended to circumvent Cape Harbor setting out on December 6, 1620. In the shallop were six sailors and eleven pilgrims, including Bradford and Standish. The explorers first landed at Wellfleet Bay, near a group of Native Americans cutting up a whale on the beach. The group built a barricade and a large fire, and spent a reasonably comfortable and safe night. The next day, some went looking for a possible settlement site in the shallop, while others remained on land. They found no suitable place, but they discovered many graves and abandoned wigwams. Aware that there was a good harbor known as Thieves Harbor, the group decided to sail along the coast the next day on a direct trip to that location. As night fell, the group landed at Herring River, a tidal creek, and once again built a barricade and posted guards. Early the following day, while preparing breakfast, one of their number came running from the trees, warning of Indians, followed by a hail of arrows that harmlessly struck the sides of the barricade. After a short exchange, the attackers left. 
This attack was not some random act of violence by the Native Americans. As I cover in a future video, Europeans had been coming to these shores for years, during which the Native Americans were killed, enslaved, and generally mistreated by some. They spent about three days exploring the area, finally finding what would become Plymouth Plantation. The area was cleared and showed signs of cultivation and previous habitation. To be clear, there was no mention in Bradford's history or any other primary sources that they actually stepped on a rock or upon the landing of the entire party. This appears to be lore that developed over time. What they didn't know is that this had once been a flourishing Native American community until diseases brought by Europeans wiped it out. This map of the site was drawn by Samuel D. Champlain in 1605 while it was still going strong. The next day they sailed back to the Mayflower with the good news. The first year for the Pilgrims and their non-separatist companions was trying and filled with momentous events, events I cover in a future video. Be sure to click on the bell to be notified when I post new videos. Well that's it for this video. As you can see, the topics we'll discuss in this channel will analyze both ancient and current beliefs. There's no correct answer for most of what we cover when we do this. Instead, we explore and come to tentative conclusions based on what we learn while being open to changing our beliefs when additional information becomes available. Please subscribe if you learned something or were challenged by what I covered in this video. If you want to be able to engage in in-depth discussions about the video topics and download the guides associated with the videos, while also supporting the production of these videos, please become a member of my Patreon page. Until next time, keep an open mind.